Hi, I'm Mark Madison, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our monthly series of Conservationists in Action. Today, we have a very exciting speaker. We're very lucky to uh, lure here to Shepherdstown. Uh, we have children's author Lynn Cherry with us. And, and for those of you uh, who haven't heard of Lynn, the very few of you who haven't, uh, Lynn has written over 30 children's books, uh, a number of which have, have won awards. She also illustrates them. A few of my favorites are The Great Kapok Tree, A River Ran Wild, The Armadillo from Amarillo, and, and my kid's favorite, uh, How Groundhog's Garden Grew. <laughs> I love your books. She's also been very active in, in um, trying to empower children and get them into nature. And uh, she's been out here this week at NCTC. Um, talking with some of our students, talking with some of our staff out here, and just uh, really adding a lot of value to our educational work out here. So Lynn, uh, welcome to the studio, and it's so good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Well, Lynn's going to talk a little about empowering children through, through books and nature, and I'm, I'm going to turn over to Lynn at this point. I would just like to remind uh, those of you in the audience, this is actually a live broadcast, so if you have any questions uh, for Lynn about her children's books, about children and nature, about empowering children and things you can do for the environment, please feel free to call in, email in, fax in, any means you can communicate with us. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions. All right, Lynn, let me turn over to you. Well, I just thought I'd begin before I, I show the PowerPoint <laughs> okay. to show the audience this Japanese stilt grass, which I picked on the way here. And I, th this became, it's, a, it's an invasive species, and I noticed it at my place. I have a farm about three years ago, and I didn't realize it was such an invasive, and now it's completely carpeting my whole forest floor and, and has right. pushed out all the native wildflowers. So this is just along the edges here at NCTC, and you have time to actually do <laughs> we'll something. learn from your experience. Learn, yeah, learn from my travails. And, right. and just if it comes, it comes in a lot on mowers, like if you have someone mowing your lawn, okay. their lawn companies, is, and it, it's a... Uh, have you been able to control yours at all, or is it it's, too late now? It is too late, so that's why I thought I'd share this with you before it's not too late, and people out there, Japanese still grass. Okay. Well, thanks for empowering <laughs> NCTC. <laughs> And now, do you, do you want to go into the some of the slides? Jen? Sure. Yeah. Let's just go into the slides. It's uh, this is a presentation that I give all around the country, actually all around the continent. And um, I start by by um, by talking about how it is that I started writing and drawing. And my mom was an illustrator. She was an illustrator of of children's magazines when I was a little kid. And I have a book called Making a Difference in the World that shows me and my little card table <laughs> uh, doing the illustrations while my mom was doing illustrations. And then I grew up and became an illustrator. And then she followed in my footsteps and she became a children's book illustrator. And this is one of her books, The Floating House. It's a history by Scott Russell Sanders. And she's, uh, she's really done some beautiful books, The, the Real Tooth Fairy. Oops. And um, this is probably her most popular. So anyway. Um, when I was a kid, I had inspiration, <laughs> and I would do these little books like this, Kitty's Adventures. And this was a book about my cat, and I learned a lot from my cat. I learned that if you sit absolutely still in the woods, that the animals come up to you. And so um, I would go and do this. That book I brought to my publisher when I was in my 20s, and she said, this is a really good story <laughs> you wrote when you were eight but you've improved a little bit as an illustrator. So can you redo the illustrations? And I did, and so they published it as this book here, Archie, Follow Me. And then, uh, whoops, I've got to get the, just the hang of this. So this is part of the book, um, Kitty's Adventures. I didn't include this in Archie, Follow Me, but when I was uh, about eight, my cat disappeared, and she was like a dog. She'd follow me everywhere. and. When I finally found her, she was in a steel leg hold trap. And you can see her paw is stuck in the trap, and she'd been in this trap for four days. She'd lost a lot of blood, and she was very weak. We had to find someone who could get this trap open. And the vet wanted to put her to sleep, but I said, no, I wanted to, to nurse her back to health. And I did, and she lived to be a ripe old age. No, oh, that's a great story. Yeah. Except for the leg trap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry for the kitty. But that's how I learned about steel leg hold traps, and I knew that as an adult I would never wear a fur coat after seeing the torture that my cat went through, realizing that foxes and, and all kinds of animals sure. captured for fur coats go through the same. So the, the place that I spent my childhood, it was, 
in a suburb, but it was on the edge of farms and fields and creeks. And so I used to play in a place very much like this. And I think that most people who go into environmental education, who work at nature centers, that they'll tell you the same story, that they bonded with nature at an early age. Yeah. And so this is so important that kids get out in nature. And this is really what I'm committed to, is connecting kids to the natural world. So I was, um, well, I'll go back to this Archie Follow Me book for a minute. So I would sit as still as a statue, and I would, all these animals would come out of hiding, and they'd come right up to me. Like in this case, a pheasant came right <laughs> up to my, she came right up to my foot and then sniffed it, and I realized that, um, and then she realized that I, was, uh, that I was human, and she went squawking off into the underbrush with her chicks. And, oops. So um, as I sat there, like a statue, I noticed all these birds. And, and this place that I would go, I noticed that every year the same birds came back to the same nests and to the same nest holes. And this was their habitat. Yeah. So I illustrated this book called When I'm Sleepy. It was by um, Valerie Show Carey, I believe. And this is, uh, you can see the uh, little girl imagining she's sleeping with these various creatures in their habitats. And it's so nice to see kids not afraid of raccoons yeah. <laughs> or rabies. I mean, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of fear. Not to rabies. digress, but I mean, we've made kids so afraid of so much in nature. It's really yeah, problematic. I, I do believe it's the media that has done that. And it's, we're just, when you think of the danger of getting into a car, I mean, the risk <laughs> is just, it's just so far more of a risk than going outside. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beautifully illustrated. Yeah. Oh, this, uh, this, that is, that says Alsa Kamoben. This is uh, When I'm Sleepy. It's by Jane Howard. I'm sorry. It was another book by that other author. Okay. So this is by Jane Howard. Habitat, Habitat. Gotta have a habitat. It's a book by, I mean, a, a song by Bill Oliver. Mm -hmm. And there are seven frogs in this picture. And they're camouflaged. And I explained to kids how a lot of habit, a lot of reasons that the animals live in their habitat is a specific habitat is because they can be really cryptic. They can almost disappear. And uh, this is in my backyard. Oh, wow. And leaf litter, wet leaves are really important as, as I'm sure a lot of the viewers realize that there's a real problem with frogs and amphibians die off. And a lot of it is because people break up the leaves. They don't allow wet leaves to stay yeah. on the lawn and it's uh, destroying habitat. And I think we can be all be very grateful to Richard Louvre, who I know spoke here at NCTC, for his book, Last Child in the Woods which put together a lot of the scholarly work on, um, on what he calls nature deficit disorder, about how kids are growing up without the advantage of connecting to nature and to the natural world. It's he did one book. of these broadcasts, and this is a nice follow-up, because oh, one of the things great. Richard said is, is we need new ways to entice children to nature, and I think your mm -hmm. books do a wonderful job of that. I, I think they do. I, I'm, I'm really happy that there, it seems to be working because whenever kids go outside, it's an adventure. Yeah. Just stepping outside the door, something happens. You know, whether it's finding a turtle or just watching the birds or listening to the bird song. So one of the things that I've been promoting is schoolyard gardens, backyard mm -hmm. gardens and schoolyard gardens. And of course, National Wildlife Federation has, has had this problem, has had this program yep. for many years. But th this is a school I visited in Virginia, Tuckahoe Elementary, mm -hmm. where the whole curriculum revolves around outdoor education and, and their schoolyard garden. And they teach about how habitat is really important for, you know, to provide na um, wildlife with food, shelter, and place to live, place to raise their young. The first thing that you can do, whether it's your backyard, your schoolyard, your nature center, really simple thing is just plant sunflowers. Mm -hmm. Because goldfinches, tufted titmice, a lot of birds just love those sunflowers. And I, I actually prefer them to a bird feeder because the birds are still acting like birds and they're yeah. learning how to forage. And plus they're beautiful. And also they, they're, they're also, they are also beneficial for pollinators, you know, bees and butterflies. And then you can plant other kinds of flowers that will attract hummingbirds. So um, there's a book by Steve Kress called mm -hmm. The Backyard Bird Garden. It's a wonderful book. And it explains how you can plant certain plants that will attract certain birds. You can actually garden for four specific birds to attract. Steve them to did one work. of these programs too, <laughs> many years ago in 1999. Oh, the other thing you can use sunflowers for is to cover up an ugly garage, <laughs> like I inherited in my backyard. We plant them all around. Now you can't see it. 
<laughs> they're beautiful. That's a bonus. And then if once they grow really big, they're really nice little forts for kids who can crawl inside. Yep. Yeah, Sunflower House is a nice book. So kids at the school um, were they lobbied to to create a no mow zone, realizing that meadowland, grassland was was um, disappearing. Mm -hmm. And so their their principal agreed, and they created this no mow zone. And what they did first is they did a census where they went down on the grass on their hands and knees and magnifying glasses and scientifically they looked at what was living in that in these in a square foot each kid took a square foot square foot of this grass and you know they found insects and some arthropods but you know really not that much con con compared to when they let it grow and once they let it grow just the biodiversity was staggering because birds came and were eating the seeds from the grass and rabbits and voles and and all kinds of animals wow. were then using that as habitat. And it was very exciting for the kids. One of my uh, <laughs> big bandwagons is turn off the TV <laughs> and go outside, get animated. So a lot of kids have these TV free weeks at their school and the parents spend time with their kids in the evenings. They go to town meetings, they get involved in their community, they go talk to their neighbors. And right now we have really a breakdown of community. And I, I, th I think part of it is because of television. Okay. So turn off the TV and do something with, your, with, your, with your, your children and hopefully get involved in your community. Or go read an environmental <laughs> book. <laughs> do you have any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite a few. Um, all right. I did this poster when I lived in Ithaca a fa the Family Reading Partnership gives a free book to every child that's born in Ithaca. Oh, wow. And reading is, is a value that they, they are trying to purvey as a community. It is wonderful. That's my dog. My dogs are Jasper and Rocky in that. What you know and love, you will care for. And so we go out on nature hikes. We found this red eft at one point. And again, you can see leaf litter. Yep. Very important. Keep those leaves, those wet leaves on, your, on the ground. This was under a rotted log, a uh, yellow spotted salamander. So I, I had mentioned that woods that I had when I was a kid, and I used to spend every waking hour there, and I knew every tree, what lived in every tree, what birds lived in every nest, and I came home from school one day, and they were bulldozing it. And this was one of the great traumatic experiences of my life. I thought, where did all those animals mm -hmm. go, and did they survive? And I couldn't even go to school for a week. I was just, I was just crying and very upset. But then, you know, as was all, all things, time heal, heals all wounds. And, and, I, and as I grew up, um, I forgot about that woods. Not totally, but, you know, mm -hmm. the pain subsided. But then when I started hearing about the rainforest, right. that whole feeling of loss welled up. And I thought, I have to write a book that lets kids know about the destruction of the tropical rainforest and maybe they can do something about it and they really have kids have raised thousands of dollars they've saved thousands of acres of rainforest especially in monteverde costa rica mm -hmm. in the, the eternal forest of the children they raise pennies for the planet they put on plays they get these certificates from nature conservancy <laughs> for saving acres and it's really remarkable what they're doing to research my book i went to brazil and this is a real kapok tree here oh, cool. and they are the tallest tree in the rainforest. They're an emergent, so they emerge over the canopy, mm -hmm. and they're really remarkable trees. This is one in St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So I went to Brazil. I, ch I flew from D.C. down to Florida and then took another plane and flew to, to uh, Manaus in Brazil, and I, I stayed there for a couple weeks, and that was... The, the flight was 18 hours, but that was the easy part of the trip. When I got there, I found what I'd been reading about, the destruction of rainforest for cattle ranches. And this was an aha moment. because so I took a look at these, these uh, cattle, and I thought, these cattle might be butchered, they might be made into hamburger, and I might be eating them. They might be shipped abroad. And if I'm doing that, then I'm part of the reason for the destruction of the rainforest. So I thought, I am never eating a cow, I mean, I'm never eating a hamburger again, unless I know where that came, where it came that, from. Where it came from. Right. This was the scariest moment of my trip, looking down, I'm going down a, a really windy road. You're looking through the windshield of a yeah. Jeep, 
And the, this friend who was an ethnobotanist had told me the story of going down one of these and his car started spinning around because the roads are like mud. They're like yeah. ice. They're wet mud. And he'd spun around. His car had flipped over. He'd been thrown out of the window. He'd broken his arm and his leg. Laid there for hours till someone finally found him. So we went down this and the car was just spinning around out of control. But luckily, we didn't flip over and we got to the bottom in one piece. So getting back to the book, the man goes into the forest and he starts cutting the tree and the heat and the hum of the forest lull him to sleep. And as he sleeps, these different creatures come down and whisper in his ear a litany of reasons why he shouldn't cut the tree. And every plant and animal in this, in this book is a real rainforest. Plant or animal is totally scientifically accurate. This is an emerald green boa and the boa constrictor slithers down the tree and hisses in the man's ear, Senor, this is a tree of miracles. My ancestors have lived here for generations. You must not cut it down. This is a silky anteater. It has very soft, silky fur and a very long tongue, and it sticks its tongue into hollow <laughs> logs to get the ants out, which is why it's called an anteater. And the anteater says, Senor, the big man tells you to chop down a beautiful tree. He does not think of his own children, who tomorrow must live in a world without trees. And the jaguar says, Senor, if you chop down this tree, where will I find my dinner? So every day I would do what I did when I was a kid, and I'd go into the forest and sit absolutely still and paint my paintings. And as I was sitting here by the stream, I heard this sound coming from the underbrush, sort of like a <sighs> I thought, that sounds like a jaguar. What do I do if that's a jaguar? Do I sit here? Do mm -hmm. I jump up and run? To jump up and, and yell boo? Yeah. I didn't know. So I listened, and after a while, I heard it again. Finally, I saw it, and what it was was a two-inch-long hummingbird. Oh. <laughs> and I was greatly relieved, but it came right up to me. Yeah. <laughs> and when I went back to the base camp, I asked, well, what would I have done if that was a, um, a jaguar? And they said, the worst thing you could have done would have been to get up and run because it might have thought you were prey. Right. If you had just sat there, it probably would have ignored you, but if you jumped up and yelled boo, it would have taken off like a shot because we are their worst enemies. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so um, getting back to the book, the man wakes up. He's surrounded by these rare and wondrous creatures. He stands up, draws back his arm, well, picks up the axe, draws mm -hmm. back his arm as if to strike the tree, and then he hesitates, and he drops his axe and walks out of the rainforest, thereby saving all these animals who depend on the kapok tree. When I was in Peru, we found a little sloth. Actually, the native people eat sloth, and they had killed this the mother of this little sloth, and the natives, the native people brought this little sloth that fit in my hand uh, in, in their dugout canoe down the river, and we didn't think it was alive, but one of the teacher's sons said, well, can he feed it? And he gave it a bottle of Cecropia leaves, and it revived it. It was just starving. And then um, he, this little boy, he became sloth mother. He slept with the sloth around his neck, fed it, and then when he left, I became sloth mother. <laughs> and then after about a week, it was just big, roly poly belly, and it was just fine. And, and that, that sloth still is in residence at ASIR. This is a research center up in a cecropia tree next to the, the lodge. And rainforests are very important, as we know, and um, this is what some of the kids have been doing. Here, these kids in DC put on a play of the great Kapok tree, and these kids in Fort Lauderdale put on a musical that knocked my socks off. <laughs> and they wrote their own, mu their own music and beautiful choreography. And in this way, the, the yeah. kids teach the whole community about the rainforest, and often they'll raise funds for rainforest preservation by putting on these plays. It's a hell of a book. It never occurred to me it could be uh, torted into a musical. <laughs> yeah, I, I must get hundreds of these videotapes and, and letters a year about schools that are, or private companies that have put on this as a That's production. Great. Yeah, and the See the Storm in the Mangrove Tangle is also now being used as a play. Wonderful. Um, I have this friend Mark Plotkin and he was in the book, he was in the movie Amazon, the IMAX movie, and we wrote a book together called The Shaman's Apprentice. He wrote Tales of the Shaman's Apprentice. Yeah, I, I, did he write Witch Doctor of the Wyannis too? Or I, I read something by Plotkin when I was still an uh, evolutionary biologist, something uh, Ethnobotanical, he wrote. I can't remember what, but his, yeah, he's really well known. He's, yeah, he's really famous for the, uh, the, shame, the Tales of the Shame Shaman. Apprentice, which is a wonderful book about his work with the Tirio Indians in Suriname. So we went there, and this is the village Kwamala in um, 
on the Sipalawini River, and this was the closest place to Eden, or heaven, I've ever been. And the people have very simple lives. They don't, by our standards, have anything. And so this really changed my outlook on life. And I came back and thought, I don't need all these things. <laughs> you know, spent, to be happy, and these people were the happiest people I've ever met. And I started just divesting of things and stopped buying things. And it's like, it's very liberating. I was in Peace Corps for three years. And yeah, yeah you wonder, you have one pot and one pan. It's like, why, <laughs> why yeah. do I need all this stuff in my kitchen? It does, yeah. does make you reconsider. It really does. There's a group called New American Dream that's really great. It has ways of simplifying your life. Oh, cool. So I got a, letter, a lot of letters from kids. And when I wrote The Great K-Pop Tree, I got a letter from someone out in the Pacific Northwest. And they said, you know, we have a rainforest right here in this mm -hmm. country. And I didn't at that time know that, the, um, of course, the old growth forest. And so I went to visit the Wilhelmette National Forest and I had to write a book about it. It was just so staggeringly beautiful. And whoops, oh, I gave away the punchline. And so here's um, where I did my research. And it just, when, when these, comp these uh, timber companies say, well, they're replanting, mm. I mean, it's just, so bogus, really, because <laughs> this is, this is a, an ecosystem that's evolved for thousands, millions of years. Things growing on things growing on things. And, whoops. Um, and here's where I did my research in the Olympic National Park. Park yeah. And then I thought I'd go visit the Olympic National Forest. <laughs> and this is what I saw. That's a picture from the Olympic National Forest. And I thought, hmm, how can that be a <laughs> forest if there are no trees in it? And this was just really an, an eye-opener. And so I flew over with a night hawk and saw all these clear cuts, all the brown areas are clear yeah. cuts. And I found that although there's often a perimeter of old growth that's left by the roads, that once you get inside, many of these national forests are just completely clear cut. And then you've been reading about the landslides and, sure. and how the flooding downstream because the water doesn't, isn't able to soak into the ground, it just runs off. And so. I wrote this book called The Dragon and the Unicorn, and although it's a fantasy, all the facts in it are, are correct, where this dragon and the unicorn live in the forest very happily, and until one day someone's coming and burning their trees and cutting them, and this is a king, and he, his daughter is a princess, and she's sympathetic toward the animals, so she brings these bird's nests deeper into the forest where they'll be, where they'll be safe, and then the, the, the king sends out his knights to capture the unicorn, and he almost does, but Valeria the dragon comes and burns the ropes and sets her free. Then they go into hiding behind the waterfall and they wonder how can they save themselves and how can they save the forest? And they come up with a plan and the unicorn appears to the princess and draws her deep into the forest and there she gives her a short course on temperate rainforest ecology. And here she's teaching her how every year that a tree grows, it forms a, a ring mm -hmm. and they count 600 rings on this tree. And the unicorn is saying that when this tree was a, a, a little seedling. The forest was then a great forest. You know, they're, they really, they're thousands of years old. So kids are trying to save forests, you know, older forests near where they live. This is, here's some, these are some kids in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and they had used this, this, uh, this forest as a, like a, a living classroom, and then it was, it, was, uh, it was bought by a developer, and he was going to clear cut it. And they said, what can we do? And the teacher said, well, let's go talk to the developer. Maybe we can ask him to save it and we can call it the eternal forest of the children. And so they went to the developer and he said, well, I can't give it to you, but I can sell it to you for $100,000. And they said, we're just third graders. <laughs> we don't have $100,000. But the teacher used it as a math problem. And they went into the forest and they counted the number of trees and they divided them into $100,000. And they came out with $14 a tree. And they said, well, let's just save it tree by tree. So the kids did walkathons and bake sales. And then they wrote letters to the editor. And this was, these letters were about the science, you know, the ecology of right. an older, an old growth forest, the importance of an older far, forest. And these letters were so compelling that lo the local radio station asked the kids to come on and, and speak about the forest. And they did, and then they got asked to be on TV. And once that happened, so many people saw them that they started sending in money, and these kids, in six weeks raised not $100,000, but $200,000. That's a great story. Yeah, and they saved this forest. It's called the Estevant Pines, and they're safe.
They are now the eternal forest. <laughs> of the children. That's perfect. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. So kids are behind a lot of recycling programs, and they really do, they really can make a difference. Uh, a River Run Wild is used in a lot of fourth grade yeah. classes. It's in the fourth grade, in many fourth grade textbooks. So it's part of the curriculum. And in, in this book, the Native Americans first come to the Nashua, then the colonists come, they drive the Indians from the land. The people from Europe come, they build mills, and they think of the river as a big garbage can. And at first, the river is able to clean away the waste, wash away the waste, but then the pollution starts to accumulate. And in the 1950s, as unbelievable as it seems, the river was looked like this. It was either you know red, blue, green, whatever color. They were dyeing the paper, and people don't believe me. So this is actually a photograph of the Nashua River. So in the book, one of the last remaining Indians has a dream, and in this dream, the first Indian who ever saw the Nashua when it was clean and beautiful comes back, sees the river all polluted and smelling, and he cries. And where his tears fall, the river is cleansed. And the Indian who has this dream wakes up and runs to his friend Marion Stoddard and says, we have to clean up this river. And Marion is responsible for creating the Nashua River Watershed Association. And she's, she really is an, a remarkable woman. And so they organize, and they end up cleaning up the river. And her, uh, here, here kids were very involved. Uh, they would hold up signs like this, hold your nose, Nashua River ahead by the <laughs> side of the road. And then the adults would see him and say, but isn't that impossible to clean up that river? And the kids would testify. They'd say, we just want this river the way it was when you were kids. You, know, you could fish in it. You could swim in it. You could drink it. And so they um, started, I think I'm going backwards. They started taking, doing water testing and realized when the science teachers would take the kids down to the river, there was nothing alive in it. When the river was red, the, that river was dead. And so the kids brought dirty river water to the politicians, and they got the river cleaned up. And over a 10-year period, the Nashua River Water Association worked to get this river cleaned up. They worked for uh, a Clean Water Act, and Massachusetts passed the first Clean Water Act. And it's a, an amazing success story. They, they cleaned up this river. And now it's so clean that you can <laughs> canoe on it, you can swim it, and it's a class, you know, there's a, a really world-class yeah. fishing stream. It's a great story. So I, I got a lot of letters from kids about <laughs> uh, how they cleaned up their river. And this book has been, you know, I thought it was a local book when I first wrote it, but then it was published in Japanese and all, country, and, and all kinds of other languages. It's used all around the world. And it's an allegory, really, for what hap has happened to, to rivers during industrialization and how now people are cleaning them up. Yeah. So it's a pretty exciting story. It's a great story. Yeah. I do have to ask you, though, the, the Native American crying, did you... Borrow that from the ad campaign? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> that was the best anti-litter campaign I've ever seen. Yeah, well, you know, maybe subconsciously because... Because um, the kids today wouldn't have seen it. I, no. mean, I saw it when I was five or something. But we but... never had a TV. Ah, well So then... it wasn't until after I did that that people started drawing my attention to it. It's it's an image that sticks in people's minds, just like yeah. your book. I mean, The River Went Ran Wild is a beautiful book. It's not local at all. <laughs> we read it when we first came out here, mm -hmm. and I'd actually seen it for sale in Australia, of all places. No yes, yes. Um, it's so. called, it is an allegory, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's the same, yeah, different river, same story. Yeah, and, and uh, so it's used widely around the country. One of the most exciting stories is, is, is just a true life story, how in the in Rockville, Maryland, these kids read the book and they thought, well, let's study the history of our river. And so they found that it had been a shad run. And they thought, well, can we, can we make it a shad run again? Mm -hmm. So the teacher took them down. They did the water testing. They found that it was way too polluted to be a shad run. But like the kids in the book, they contacted the, um, the local, local authorities. Now there was a Devar Department of Envir Environmental Protection that yep. they could contact. So they worked with that person and they got the river cleaned up. And then they found that if they released shad in the river, the, sh the shad wouldn't be able to come back because there were dams. So these third graders got dams removed. They got three dams removed. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's amazing. Work with their politicians. And then they raised these fry, these shad fry in their classroom and they released them. And they, you know, they released them, I 
guess it was what in the summer mm -hmm. and then in the spring and then the, the fish go out to the ocean and they change their morphology they yeah come all the or way shad back are fascinating yeah they, they swim back up and they actually they came back so the kids have restored this as a shad run it's pretty amazing and so this story was told by sandy burke who taught the kids how to raise shad um, in her book let the river run silver again pretty remarkable story but it's kind of exciting you know how the book c creates this action that it's then written about by another author yeah it's really neat so um when, when i was a kid i hated geography but now i love it and so um i went all through texas and this i have this little armadillo um going my you know, following my route through texas and this is the armadillo from amarillo wonders where in the world am i and he goes up on the back of an eagle and then it's sort of like powers of 10 where he goes up and up from the surface yep. of the earth and um sees where in the world he is and then he hooks up with the space shuttle i had to use the space shuttle because when i was a kid one of my neighbors always wanted to be an astronaut and she grew up and she became an astronaut that's her in the middle and she sent me some pretty amazing photographs from space when i was researching this book and you can see from space how when, where there's clear cuts um, on rivers all around the whole globe that you can see the silt coming down the rivers and then this what you're looking at here is the all the white things are clouds and then the top is the the little the land and then in the middle of the mouth of the river and then that brown that's brown yeah. fingers of topsoil going out into the ocean and she said you see these fingers of topsoil she's been up now four times in the, in the shuttle so two years apart she'll see these fingers of topsoil getting longer and longer where they go out into the ocean and they cl they they uh, cover coral reefs and seagrass beds so this clear cutting has so many impacts you know the flooding the trees themselves the coral reefs and just uh, amazes me that it's still going on and here you can see the interface between the the land and the ocean so in the tropical areas like in florida mangroves are really essential for yeah. taking some of that silt and, and sequestering it in the roots of the mangroves and and um, keeping the seagrass beds and the coral reefs um, from getting destroyed and they're also really important as nurseries for fish and for protection of the coastal areas during hurricanes and everyone knows about the, you know the story of Indonesia now about the tsunami and how it was the places where the mangroves were intact that protected the coastal areas and the places where they had cut them were just some of them wiped off the face of the earth so I wrote the Sea the Storm and the Mangrove Tangle actually well before the, the tsunami and before all these hurricanes. But it just can't happen to come out right when all these things were happening. And so I would really hope that this book would be part of the curriculum in Florida and coastal areas, because uh, these mangroves are really pretty amazing. They, you know, the propagule, that's the, like a living seed, yeah. and they can actually uh, float across the ocean, like from Africa to the Caribbean on currents and plant themselves. And the book is also about biocomplexity. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, the mangrove is just a really simple system. But then as it gets bigger and bigger, more and more things depend on it until you have a whole ecosystem built up. And that, that's a good, you know, really excellent uh, rookery for birds and also underneath for a protection for a nursery for fish. And as this one fisherman says to the other, many of the fish in the sea start there lives in the tangled roots of the mangroves. You know, looking at that illustration, are you ever tempted to do like a, a, a textbook or a science book? <laughs> I mean, that illustration, if we can put that back up, and that's a perfect depiction of biodiversity mm -hmm. and, and ecosystems and mm -hmm. food chains and so on. I mean, um, well, you know, it's I'll, gorgeous. Well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, my background, my original background was biology, and we, you mm -hmm. know, we usually get sketchy, turgid little things mm -hmm. with arrows. Well, the, the way they're teaching now, they use a lot of trade books mm -hmm. as, not as textbooks, but, you know, to supplement the, the um, curriculum. And in fact, with No Child Left Behind, that's been quite, kind of a problem because it's harder for teachers to do that. And yet, you know, that's, that's, it was so important for teachers to yeah. be able to bring in these other materials. So I think that a lot of people are trying to, to change a lot of things about No Child Left Behind. So, you know, like taking kids outside, it's really hard to take kids outside with, you know, while you're teaching to the standards. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has to, is, is being rethought 
but really needs to be changed. Yeah. But this, um, the mangrove book is, I know, used in a lot of classrooms. And the great cape oak tree is in most every third grade textbook. And then there's a teacher's guide that Harcourt puts out mm -hmm. that basically has those pictures and uses great. them for curriculum. And same with A River Around Wild in their fourth grade Harcourt textbook. So, so you're the fun part of the curriculum. I am. <laughs> I'm the fun part. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I think it's really important. I, I do the books that reach a kid's heart, you know, so that the, and the kids relate to the, 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 in, the individual animals in the story. Mm -hmm. And then they're driven to ask more questions, so it's more inquiry-based, you know, that the kids drive the curriculum, they ask, and then I had a teacher in Princeton who said, you know, we use the books, we take the kids outside, and then she said, I'm just there checking off all the standards I need to be teaching, and the kids are, are driving at the curriculum and asking the questions. So it doesn't need to, doesn't mean just because you have to, to, just because you have to teach to standards doesn't mean that you stop taking kids outside or you stop right. using supplementary material. It's just you use it a little differently. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, um, mangroves are not mangoes. <laughs> I like people get them mixed up. So these are mangoes. This is a mango tree in Australia, just so you know. Yeah, I had a mango in my backyard in the Philippines. <laughs> okay. And here you can see this, a little close-up of the... Then a hurricane comes and the mangroves protect all the birds. and Manatees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man Very close to our heart in the Fish and Wildlife Service. Manatees and dolphins and, and um, mangroves. I, the, one of the biggest threats to mangroves is shrimp farms, especially in Indonesia. And so now I've also had to give up eating shrimp. And shrimp are awfully good. Oh, yeah. But it really... Can't you eat them if you know where they come from? They almost <laughs> like all on Cape come, Cod or something. Don't they come from the ocean there? <laughs> Some restaurants will say that these are hand-caught shrimp or that they're mm -hmm. sustainably caught shrimp, and yeah, sure, but most are not. So if if they're not, if it's not specifically on the package that that's that they're sustainably harvested, that they they usually come from these these shrimp farms. And so, if you want to help save mangroves, mm -hmm. one of the, the things you can do is just stop eating shrimp and, and write to the shrimp companies, or you know, or write mm -hmm. to. Um, the these these different um, well you can look on the website there's all yeah. kinds of addresses that you can write to write to the government of Bimini. We should mention this you have a very informative website too. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to give them the URL so I don't mess it up? Sure, it's, just, <laughs> it's not too it, tricky. <laughs> it's just lynncherry.com. L y n n e cherry like the fruit. Dot com. Dot com. And if you dig into it, there's a lot of educational materials up there. Yeah, like if you click on the title of any of the books. Like, for instance, you click on the title, you go to books and you click on the title of the mangrove book. It takes you into this whole website on mangroves and um, has a lot of pictures about Bimini because Bimini is in the process of destroying most of its mangroves. It was supposed to be a marine protected area. Yeah. And then a new group of politicians came in and then they sold it to a developer. And he's just, it's amazing. You look on this website, and I have links to this on my website, but you look, you, you look on his website and he's, actually advertising it as an eco resort and saying about how he's got all this you know intact ecosystem when he has destroyed 99% of that ecosystem and is threatening the future of the lemon shark and a lot of other wow. and the people who who have sustainably harvested the ocean for generations so it's pretty sad but you know you can write to the government of Bimini <laughs> I have all those <laughs> and you can addresses. find out on the very educational web it is a great website I really yeah. enjoyed it yeah whoops Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so this is in the Cayman Islands where they're teaching kids about the food web. And each child imagines that they're a different animal or critter or uh -huh. insect. And then if they have a relationship with some other animal or insect or uh, ecosystem, then they, they give them a piece of this line. And then all the lines just going every which way like a big spider web and it's called it's a web of life and I like this because it's a, a, a real visual example of a food web and yeah. it's fun you know you get the kids outside and do this food web exercise and kids have been replanting mangroves uh, in a lot of the tropical areas uh, you're probably you probably know how how popular um, the great the great kapok tree has been yeah and one of the problems I have with that, I mean, it's a, I think it's a really, it's really a good book about ecology. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the basic eco ecological principles like trees produce oxygen and, you know, all, thing, all living things are interconnected. I think that that's 
really good thing about the book, but a lot of teachers have been using the great kapok tree and doing these big rainforests in the classroom instead of taking kids outside. And if it precludes taking kids outside, I'd much rather they didn't even teach about the rainforest because I think the most important thing is that kids get outside and have firsthand experiences in nature. And so on my website, I have a curriculum called Rainforest Your Forest, which is a way to teach about the rainforest comparatively, taking kids outside and looking at, well, how is this different? Well, every, all green things photosynthesize, looking at maybe collecting rain and looking at the difference in rainfall between the tropics and wherever you live, and um, all the other similarities and differences you can come up with hands-on. Yeah. And Flute's Journey was another attempt at getting uh, this connection between where we live and the rainforest, because a lot of migratory birds fly between the rainforest and then all over North America, you know, where we live. So um, it's kind of a, uh, well, flute is um, a wood thrush. And here in, at NCTC, there are so many wood thrushes. Every, <laughs> I wake up in the morning to the song of wood thrushes. I've, it's so wonderful because they're really getting kind of rare. And then to come here where everywhere you go, it's this echoing, hauntingly beautiful song of the wood thrush, and you wake up to it. It's just beautiful. So, anyway. So I have a theory on that. What is your <laughs> it's theory totally on unscientific, it? but uh, we have another great image here of a, a pelican sitting on a Pelican Island refuge sign. I think, uh, in, in some ways, birds can sense areas in, in, in which they're appreciated or at least protected. I mean, it's <laughs> nutty. I mean, my background is, like I said, biology initially. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think you do at attract more birds where um, um, where there's uh, at least kindness towards them or appreciation well, they're towards safe. them. Yeah, and they're safe too. But I mean, wood thrushes, people don't hunt them. But, uh, you but know, they, yeah, cats do. And there might be a more practical reason. We tried mm -hmm. to keep the human imprint really small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the 540 acres, you mm -hmm. know, we really compacted it. And so they may like that. Or you noted probably most astutely that um, we might have some of the right type of habitat. For them have, where they like to yeah, nest. You have correct habitat, and you also have a very big buffer zone around the woods from suburbia. So you don't have house cats coming in yes. to kill them. I don't think. I mean, it would be a pretty long trek for a cat to no, go No, we through. don't have too many feral cats yeah. out here. And you probably have foxes and coyotes, which probably keep down the, the cats. And yeah, I haven't even seen a lot of cowbirds here. Cowbirds are no. one of the worst problems of these so. We have a good fox population around here, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, last couple of years, we've had fox um, dens right here on campus, which has been fun to see the little kits and so on. That's wonderful. But I digress. We were on yeah. Flute's journey, yeah. and then we went off. Oh, we have, uh, we have a couple of questions. I don't know, Lynn, if you feel comfortable taking a question now mm -hmm. from the audience or wanted to run through the rest of, of this. Oh. What is your preference? Um, how much time? 15. Oh, 15 minutes? Okay, I'm going to go really Quickly, okay. For five we'll, minutes. Okay. In five minutes, we'll take the questions. Yeah. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Okay. Flute's journey, um, the problems that he faces, pesticides, deforestation, um, and I won't tell the story, unfortunately. But this was an amazing story about how when I was uh, writing this book, how I put flute in a woods called the Belt Woods, which was was owned by the Episcopal Church. It had been in this man's family, Seton Belt's family, since it was given to them from the King of England, colonial days. They'd never cut a tree, and then it was given to the church with the understanding, well, it was in the will, that they would never cut a tree and never um, sell the land, but they, the Episcopal Church got the will overturned and they sold it to, they wanted to sell it to a developer. And this is uh, actually a long story. I'm trying to get a movie made of this because it was such an exciting story where kids got involved in this. They wrote letters to the bishop. They um, their letters got read on national television. We got on Sunday morning news with Charles Osgood. Oh, they showed this picture of. <laughs> we even have the sound. <laughs> That's the song of the wood thrush. Yeah. And so they played that on national TV. Oh, that's great. With that illustration. And 
so many thousands of letters came into the Episcopal Church that they decided to sell it to the Trust for, land, for Public Land, so Beltwoods is no, it's not going to look like this. And these are just some more schoolyard habitats. Um, they're just some really remarkable schoolyard habitats. I encourage everyone who's watching this, if their children, if their community, school, their elementary and junior high schools do not have naturalized schoolyards, please try and make this happen because instead of getting kids on a bus, yeah. they can go out into their backyard and have their nature center right out the door. They can sit, sit with binoculars in their library and watch uh, the animals and really have close-up experiences. This is making a difference in the world. Here's where I live. And like NCTC, I have a ver an intact ecosystem. No mosquitoes because the, the barn swallows are sweeping the skies in the day. The, the chimney swifts are sweeping the skies in the, at dusk and the bats at night. And I have some very interesting nocturnal <laughs> visitors. And I raise goats and have a beautiful garden and orchard. And sometimes my zucchini gets out of hand when I'm traveling. Oh, but, so you are the groundhog. <laughs> you are the source of that. <laughs> but How Groundhog's Garden Grew is, uh, is a book to try and encourage kids to raise their own vegetables. And a, a lot of kids will see this and they go, oh, that's how asparagus grow. Oh, that's how it's potatoes grow. But it's really how to compost and enrich your soil. I went on Martha Stewart to show her how to grow potatoes. <laughs> and it talks a lot about biodiversity and beneficial insects. My next book I'm working on is uh, about the ivory bill habitat, the cypress swamps in the south, the yeah. extent of the cypress swamps, how they used to be. And there's a group in Florida who saved their cypress swamp next to their school from development. They named themselves Save What's Left. They collected signatures. They got a bond issue on the ballot. And they were able to save 15 huge tracts of land That's in Carl Springs. Yeah, that's another. Uh, story I'm hoping to get made into a either made for TV movie or a feature movie because these cypress swamps swamps are just really spectacular. I visited the Anastasi ruins and I and I read Jared Diamond's book Collapse <laughs> and I thought, you know, we have a lot of these examples of local collapses, you know, yeah. people doing themselves in, and I and now with this this uh, all this this issue of global climate change, we now have the potential of doing the whole globe in all of us in which is really a scary thought. Um, so I've, I've written this book on um, the scientists and how it is we know what we know about climate change. Camille Parmesan studying the checker spot. And um, my, in my mangrove book here, I, I have the picture of the hurricanes. You know, mm -hmm. hurricanes from, we're seeing all these, these melting glaciers. And you know, we know it's the CO2 going into the air. Kids are writing letters to the politicians. In, in, in Harrisburg, a group of kids were able to get their their governor, Rendell, to pass a bill to stop, to, uh, to uh, make idling illegal, thereby stopping um, a lot of CO2 being put in the air. Another kid did this care about your air poster. Um, uh, this child was showing how, how um, he was supporting solar energy. He was kind of you know, putting a solar, energy, a solar panel on his helmet, yeah. but you know, trying to encourage his politicians to give uh, tax breaks for solar collectors. You can get a Prius. You can even fit your canoe on it. <laughs> That's important. Kayak easily. Not your horse, but your <laughs> canoe. Or you know, with kids, instead of going somewhere far away um, in your car, you can just go someplace local and take a nice canoe ride or go sit in a stream. You know, just simple pleasures of life and um, going to work carpooling or better yet, bike pooling. <laughs> and growing a garden and eating locally and organic. So these are just some suggestions. For Thanksgiving, with uh, how Groundhog's Garden grew at the end, they all have a big feast, and I was hoping to make Thanksgiving an Earth-related holiday again. This is something that you can do. So, you know, lots of suggestions, but um, what drives me to go around the country talking about these issues and showing kids that they can make a difference, empowering them, is that we have a great gift here. I mean, we've been given this world where all we breathe, everything we eat, everything we need comes from this planet. Mm -hmm. And it really is a great gift. And I think that all, every one of us needs to do as much as we can to give back and to make a difference in the world. And everyone, everyone can make a great difference in the world.
So I, I would love to take questions. All right, that's great. Why don't we uh, take the questions? Uh, we're just going to patch them through in a sec. But that was a wonderful presentation. Thanks for sharing that with us. That was that was superb. It was the fast version. <laughs> it didn't look that way. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, Lynn, there have been a lot of articles in the paper lately about um, songbirds and how the populations are down by 50 to 75 percent. Do you have anything to comment on that, or are you thinking about maybe writing a, a children's book about that? Well, Flute's Journey is about that. That's exactly mm -hmm. what it's about. It's about um, all the reasons that these birds are declining and, and the assaults on them. You know, um, pesticides is just a huge assault. You know, um, in fact, I just heard a story yesterday about someone here at NCTC had gotten a call that they had sprayed some kind of pesticide on their garden, and then their songbirds were lying there convulsing. <laughs> so, you know, there you have cause and effect. And um, I think if for all of us listening out, out there uh, um, that we really need to make a, a more concerted effort to eliminate the use of lawn chemicals. I think lawn chemicals are killing these birds, uh, pesticides and lawn chemicals, spraying, agricultural spraying. That's just one thing, but I think that's probably the most pervasive, especially when we export a lot of the pesticides that are not allowed in this country. Do you think the, that is also what is affecting the bees? Because those populations are down, too. Yeah, the bees, I, I know, I've heard that, too. I think it's it's multiple reasons. You have global climate change, so you're a lot of you see a lot of things changing. You see changes in ranges, uh, range changes in a lot of animals, moving north, and the, you see and just with a warmer being in a warmer temperature, um, you see it's, with the forest, for example, how you have two generations of of boring insects that are hatching out in a forest where you you only had one, and where they could. The forest could cope with one, but can't cope with two. And perhaps it's the same thing with the bees, where you know they might have had tracheomites before, but with with warmer weather or different parameters, you know these things are changing. Um, I know with a lot of the bees that the pesticides have been a problem, and that you know it's like with us. Um, sometimes we can actually live having ex pesticide exposures, but we'll have this neurological disorders, or we'll get cancer later, or our immune systems will be compromised. And I think of, of, the, of, of, I guess if I had to say one thing, it's as if the whole immune system of the whole planet is being compromised through all these multiple assaults. And so although we can maybe survive, that, we're, our, our, that our immune systems are not what they were, so they can't fight these assaults. And I think the same thing's happening with humans as it is with bees and with birds. It's just that we're not making at least the media, well, you know, if you can't really make those connections because now with scientific proof, you have to have cause and effect. And when it's multiple uh, causes, it's very, very hard to tease out those causes. But I think it's kind of a no-brainer. It's kind yeah. of, you know, intuitively we know if we, we're spreading poisons all over the place and, we're, and prescription drugs are now in our water and that all these pollutants are everywhere, it just simply can't be good for the bio, the whole uh, system. Read in Rachel Carson's words from 45 years ago. And, yeah. And Didn't we learn anything? I know. <laughs> the, the debate goes on. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have another question, actually. If, if... Hello? Hi. Go ahead, Robin. Oh, hi. Hi, Mark. Hi, Lynn. I loved your presentation. It's very inspiring and imaginative. Thank you. As you know, there's a children and nature movement sweeping the country. It is as if the skies have opened. How do you think the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can contribute to the children and nature movement? Well, I guess it all boils, it all boils down to funding. You know, they have certain you know they have a certain amount of money and, and they can spend it many different ways and. So if more of that money was directed toward getting kids outside, that would be very, very helpful. You know, or I know today Mark spent his morning <laughs> taking kids out fishing. And so if the time of people who worked for Fish and Wildlife was more freed up to take up, and that was a, a real priority where the people who work for these agencies, that part of their, their time, part of their, their job description was 
maybe a day a week, you know, that they're taking a group of kids out and, and, and just letting them run free, you know, with, within constraints, but really explore and experience nature the way we did when we were kids, that would be a great thing to do. How do you see your books doing that? How do you, uh, how do you think the kids make the jump from reading the book to going out in nature? I can only say through, um, well, two, the two books, A River Ran Wild and, um, and Flute's Journey, mm -hmm. and the letters I've been getting, where yeah. uh, with A River Ran Wild, the, the kids are then really curious about their own river. And so it, 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 it seems to make them want to go down and look at their river and sort of look into the river and see what's there and learn about it. And then once they've been down to the river, then you've got them, you know, because it's like when we were kids, once you've experienced the river, you fall in love with the river. Yeah. You know, you love being there and just all the things you see happening whenever you go outside. You know, just these kind of amazing things. You, you know, some people sit on, watch, watch these things on TV, but if you go outside, you know, you'll see that hawk catch that, right. that cardinal or you'll see that fish jump way out of the water or, you'll see, or the dragonfly will land on your hand. So, or you'll find that that black sand is actually see a seething mass of frogs that are only a, yeah. a quarter of an inch long. So, um, it's it's just getting them outside, and that nature sells itself. Because Robin's question is well poised. She's one of the mm -hmm. people helping us create this children in nature. Oh, that's program. wonderful. And um, you know, it, it's somewhat new. I mean, we've done some stuff on it, but probably not in a concerted way. And, and we have. 96 million acres and refuges and so on and, mm -hmm. and I think we may need to tap into people like you who <laughs> actually mm -hmm. know children and and have communicated effectively with mm -hmm. them what what do we do it's it's not just enough to open the gate and say well you know mm -hmm. you could go out here and walk on this boardwalk right but to to think about what their needs are and I especially like hearing that you're getting feedback from kids too mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't occur to me reading the books people are writing new letters and so on. So you may mm -hmm. be tapped more into their mindset. And this sounds like something we could work on together, like the people who are listening and, and you and, yeah. and NCTC. Um, I've, al I've also thought that we really need to partner with other, gr other groups like yes. Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, yes. that we should all be in basically in this together. I, and we, I they, they have the, they're, they're, I mean, they're, the, group, the organizations are already there. It's just a matter of, of um, helping them to have these kids have this outdoor experience so let's let's do it let's do it well this has been a very fast hour <laughs> I'm afraid we're, we're just about out of time so Lynn I'd like to thank you again so much for um, giving us this wonderful presentation and giving us some some good ideas and, and hopefully beginning a, a longer term partnership I'd like to thank those of you who took the time to, to tune in this afternoon and mm -hmm. hopefully you'll tune in to our next series uh, conservationists in action and uh, thank you all very much